So I was just, um, I thought my last time I met up with Les Stockton, he was rather reluctantly giving me a trip round um, the Wildlife Hospital, and uh, we, we met a badger having root canal surgery. Um, and there was this little moment when I saw the badger having dentistry work and thinking, this could be the solution. If we just whip out their teeth and they just suck up worms, everything will be fine. So I, I have got an exit strategy planned, the door's unlocked and I will run if it starts to get too vicious. But um, what I'm going to say, some people I know will find uncomfortable, but what I want to do is to set out the facts as we know them now, because I think it's important that when you take on this debate, these discussions, you do so from a position of authority rather than in a defensive manner, always just combating what's being thrown at you. So um, I have, over the years, spent a lot of time, an inordinate amount of time, studying um, hedgehogs. I've managed to write two books about them. Um, I, I have a third one planned, but that will require my wife to um, allow me to spend a long time traveling around the world looking for hedgehogs rather than being at home earning a living. Uh, and the fun part of this is simply that hedgehogs are easily the most cute, adorable, charismatic, beautiful, entertaining, interesting creature <laughs> on the planet, let alone just in this country. Uh, how, however, <laughs> I, I did almost very, very nearly end up with a badger tattooed on my leg. Because uh, I actually did rather like badgers as well. But what we need to do, first of all, to put a little bit of this into context, I know it's a badger conference, but I've got an audience and so I'm going to use the opportunity. Uh, the stuff that's going on with hedgehogs is real and it's serious. Uh, I'm work. The population decline, um, our latest best figures come from the, from about a year ago now, from November 2015. Population decline in Britain is by over a third, well, it's about a third in urban areas, and between a half and three quarters in rural areas. These are robust figures. These are figures with which we have got a lot of uh, faith in. And they are figures which are interesting in the fact that there is such a difference between urban and rural populations. However, some people have taken that population decline to, they, they, they take it to an extreme. They thought this is the end of the hedgehog. And um, so every now and then you'll get stories appearing about the head, fact that hedgehogs will be extinct uh, um, sometime soon. Last year, Michaela Strachan um, uh, wrote a piece in, in uh, Radio Times and she said the hedgehogs will be extinct in 10 years. So when these things happen, I find that my phone starts ringing quite a lot. And I spent a lot of time, a day and a half of interviews with various uh, news outlets, uh, basically arguing that the journalists were at fault. I'm imagining that they had misquoted her, that they weren't quoting her exactly. Of course, it'd be ridiculous to say that they'd be extinct in 10 years. There may be far fewer of them in 10 years, but you know, don't be ridiculous. Of course, you just misquoted her. Um, when eventually I got to the uh, interview from The Independent, um, um, halfway through the second day of this, uh, I was delighted to find evidence that sometimes journalists will take your words absolutely precisely. And, um, <laughs> and <but> the, <laughs> I also love the fact that, that they managed to, the algorithms on the computer have obviously been monitoring very closely what I need to be um, used for advertising. But I mean, there's a reason why I make a fuss about this. It is because we need to ensure that the evidence that we present to whoever we're discussing these things in, whether it's the planners or whether it's anybody involved with policy, uh, and it's anybody involved with trying to change the conservation status of hedgehogs, etc. We need to present robust, scientifically robust evidence. If we start over-egging the pudding, if we start saying things which are not true, which are not justifiable, which will be proved to be false in 10 years' time when there are still hedgehogs there, we undermine our case. And this has to also be the case with regards to looking at badges. You need to look at the evidence when you see the evidence, you then need to work out what you do about it. But if you ignore the evidence in the first place, it's a bit like Michaela and this. Um, it looks like you are foolish. And I think it's important that we do be robust with this. So to get these sorts of figures, we have been doing research over the years. We've done a number of different studies. Um, this was hogwash done in 2005, 2006. 30,000 people submitted data records. Uh, this was just presence or absence of hedgehogs. Now, um, green was a report of the presence of hedgehogs, red was a report of absence of hedgehogs. Not surprisingly, in the centre of London, um, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, those sorts of places, we have big absences of hedgehogs. When this data, however, is run through the statistical mill, we find that the absence of hedgehogs in, for example, Scotland, 
north of England and Wales is down in large part to an absence of people, i.e. we don't have people recording the data. The absence of hedgehogs, relative absence of hedgehogs down in the southwest, is down to an absence of hedgehogs. So there we have the beginnings of the evidence, this is over 10 years ago, of what was going on. We do a mammals on road survey, which is a fairly gruesome survey, but it is extremely valuable. It provides a very good record of different sorts of mammals, all sorts of mammals actually. And does anyone here do um, mammals on roads as a survey? It's, um, you know, you're required to do certain journeys on and repeat them over the years, and it's a particularly effective tool. Uh, um, we know, for example, that hedgehogs are not learning how to cross the roads more safely, um, and that the change in numbers hedgehogs killed on certain roads is an indicator of the change in population. Uh, it's not um, uh, down to, to you know, why is a hedgehog? That would be a lovely idea. But what we found again here is um, red dots are when there's been a journey and a hedgehog has been seen, and gray dots are when there's been a journey and a hedgehog has not been seen. And again, we show very clearly down in the southwest, there's a lot of journeys um, which are undertaken and no hedgehogs are being seen. Bearing in mind that if I was to imagine the part of the countryside which is the best for hedgehogs, It'll be the part of the countryside with the biggest and the thickest hedges, the smallest fields, and lots of you know, lush grass with worms, loads of worms. That is hedgehog heaven. Um, oh yeah, you've even got an app for your phone you can do this on. It's a great way of keeping children occupied on journeys, leave them looking out the window and they can start pressing buttons of things they see squashed. Um, another, another project that we've been right, well, this is the People's Trust for Endangered Species. I work. Um, with both the British Hedgehog Preservation Society and with the People's Trust. Um, they started living with mammals in 2003. This is a much more robust survey where people are, are monitoring similar areas in the built environment time after time after time. And um, we have 3,500 participants, uh, 7,500 surveys. And this work has shown, again, some very interesting patterns. So this is the decline in hedgehog numbers between 2003 and 2015. And over that time, the decline is now um, smooth curves, that's just over 3%. It exceeds the IUCN red list criteria for identifying species at greatest conservation risk. The hedgehog population decline is a real issue. It's something which is very serious. The proportion of sites recording badgers is showing a 2.5% increase each year over that time as well. Now, it's very easy to look at that and go, wow, this is, this is clearly evidence. But, you know, it's not. Because the... Where badgers were absent, the decline in hedgehog numbers was just as marked. So it, this is the whole way through this, it's not going to be black and white. I know there are jokes to be had with that one. It's not black and white. It's ecology. You'll find if you want an easy life in science, you go and do something like physics, where you sit behind a machine that somebody else has built and press a button until the computer goes pink, gives you lots of numbers, and you go, ooh, and then you apply for more money. Um, uh, with work with hedgehogs, with all mammal ecology, it is always going to be complex because you're involving the most complex of all of these issues, which is, which is us. Now currently, uh, it's being reviewed, this is the National Hedgehog Survey. This was using um, footprint tunnels to try and monitor presence and absence of hedgehogs around the country. Um, the data is all in, it's being analysed at the moment, um, 260 sites, and the one of the key bits about this survey was trying to identify patches of the countryside where we know there are badgers from the badger set survey and then see whether there are hedgehogs. Then if we can identify areas where badgers and hedgehogs are managing to cope, we then look more closely at those areas and find out what are the characteristics of those areas which seem to be enabling the two species to cohabit. So yes, somebody has got thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of paper with inky footprints. It's a very effective tool. So what is the issue? Is it really real? I started, I started radio tracking hedgehogs. Um, first time I did that was in 1993. And um, I had this moment of, of complete horror of pushing my way through the undergrowth and um, finding a badger eating my little willy. And what this taught me um, quite early on was that when you're naming your hedgehogs, it's probably uh, advisable to uh, give them slightly more sensible names. But at that time, I was of the mind that it's probably a learned behaviour on the part of badgers. I had released um, 12 hedgehogs from the RSPCA's West Hatch um, uh, Centre down in Somerset. 
um, just over the border into, into Devon. And uh, this was um, an area which had some hedgehogs there already. There was a badger set beside the site, and my hedgehogs did absolutely fine. And then over a period of three nights, um, two of my hedgehogs and three wild hedgehogs got eaten. I found the carcasses in a very distinctive scooped out pattern, just leaving the spines. Um, and then there was no more um, um, you know, indication that badgers were predating on hedgehogs during that time. So I was then of the opinion that this was a minor thing, it was a learned activity, a badger moving through the area, knew how to eat hedgehogs, had done so and had moved on. Um, I, in fact, defended badgers at conferences, um, saying obviously there's not really an issue, and got pulled up by a couple of people who've been doing some kind of proper, heavily statistically laid data. And it is a much more complicated issue than simply, come on, I think it's running, is it running out of batteries or maybe I am? And this is a very, very complicated issue because what concerns me most is we have evidence that badgers are having an impact on hedgehogs. I have no interest, I have absolutely no interest in having hedgehogs being used as some sort of stick to beat badgers with. Um, I have been the vocal objector to the badger cull right from the point of its um, you know, discussion. I have met with the scientists who did um, the essential work for this. Rosie Woodruff, for example, um, I mean, she's fantastic. Get her in the bar after a conference and give her a couple of beers and hear what she has to say about what she thinks about the decisions that are being made, essentially on the back of research that she has done. It's a very, I'm, so I'm very opposed to the idea of a badger cull. However, there are other people out there who are going to be very excited to find that if you have evidence of the presence of badgers moving into an area, you will tend to find that the hedgehogs disappear. And when you kill um, a bunch of badgers, as they have done, and you go back through the randomized badger control trial data, you will find that when the badgers are removed, there is some evidence of an increase in the population of hedgehogs recurring, recurring back in that area. This then le led me to write an article which ended up with the headline, Should we cull our badgers to save our hedgehogs? That was a rhetorical question. Um, and the answer was no, but what was interesting was in the comments that came below, the most frequent answer was no, but we should probably cull the farmers instead. <laughs> which is not necessarily the most constructive way of going about this sort of debate. The problem is... Well. My... <laughs> <laughs> The problem we've got is, though, if we as fans of the Badger are confronted with this sort of accusation and you rebut it with, obviously, hedgehogs don't, aren't affected by Badgers, you're not able to argue that point from any, um, with any robustness. Um, Brian May got in touch after I'd done his um, Wildlife Rocks events and said, please, would I write an article which said that Badgers don't eat hedgehogs? And I said, well, yeah, you know, my little my little willy shows that, um, uh, that that obviously they do, and that there is evidence on a much wider scale that there is a population impact. But the argument we need to have is: can we then use this as something of the word you blame? So, and this is where it gets different. This is where it becomes more nuanced. To be able to argue about an issue of blame, I feel, is utterly inappropriate because there are hedgehogs are facing a whole host of other threats. Um, 10, 11,000 years ago, the ice retreated, and we have roughly our sort of current fauna settling up home here. Badgers and hedgehogs have been as part of that fauna since then, and you know, in previous interglacials, they were also on this land together. Now, whether they lived in perfect harmony, I have no idea, but they were both present. At the moment, the hedgehog population is in a serious decline. Badger numbers have increased. Are we going to see, you know, is this, is Michaela right? Are we going to see the end of the hedgehog? And in which case, do we offer up that use of the word blame? And I believe we can't, because there are so many other confounding factors. Oh, also, sometimes we have, I forgot about this one. This is one of the most fantastic bits of journalism I've ever seen. Um, Jeremy Clarkson, noted uh, wildlife expert. Um, in fact, there is, there is some evidence that when David Attenborough eventually dies, um, that Jeremy Clarkson will be stepping in to run all of uh, the BBC's wildlife output because he has a nuanced attitude which we should respect. Um, needless to say, they blame you and your car. Um, and, and he goes on to blame actually Brian May. Um, now, obviously Brian May because he's, he's supporting those, those disease-riddled badgers. And um, I mean, I don't know much about cars. Uh, in fact, my wife still um, weeps slightly in embarrassment about when we borrowed a friend's car 
And when it wouldn't work, and we had to phone out the AA equivalent or whatever it was, and the person turned up and said, how big's the engine? I kind of went, um, I haven't got much better either. But then again, he probably isn't that au fait with the subtleties of hedgehog ecology. Um, it's in particular this one thing, the asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. I must take some clothes off, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's a distraction. Um, okay, the asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. And this is what it all comes down to. This is where it shows it is not a straightforward, simple, black and white, binary dichotomy between these two species. They have a very complex setup. And what this means, and um, there will be questions from me to you, so I'm hoping you memorize this asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. The badger and the hedgehog operate within the same ecological guild, uh, which means they essentially they eat the same food. The main diet of both of these species are earthworms throughout the whole year and various other macroinvertebrates. They're principally competitors for the same food resource. Now that means that there is a degree of antagonism already, there is a degree of competition in place. And badgers eat five earthworms or six earthworms to every earthworm that a hedgehog eats. The badgers have a capacity to move through an area and actually reduce the amount of macroinvertebrate fauna available. Now, the reason it's asymmetric is that it turns into a predatory relationship when the environment is changed. And our best understanding of this relationship, and this is the point of science, it's the way we understand it now. I could be proved completely wrong tomorrow if somebody comes along with better evidence and I will then stand in front of you next year and say something different. But the best understanding we have now is that when the environment has shifted so that there is less food for both species, their relationship shifts from one of competition to one of predation. And as much as I'm sure many of you fantasized about this beautiful image of a herd of hungry hedgehogs chasing a badger as it flees down the highways and byways of Devon, it's not that way round. Oh yes. Anyone go to Wildlife Rocks? Okay, so, Wildlife Rocks, that was so much fun. I got to introduce my favourite band. I got to introduce Hawkwind on stage. And I was just like, this is, I've seen Hawkwind so many times, but never have I smelt them. And it was, that was just incidentally, it wasn't the kind of thing. Um, and I was just, I was not, but I didn't know it was going to take me quite so long to set up a therapy. And so I had this, I had 15 minutes to talk to, so best part of 2,000 semi-drunk Hawkwind fans, about the intricacies of the asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. And what, I mean, I thought I got like two or three minutes to fill. I didn't know it was going to go on that long. And um, so it got to the point where I'd done a bit of the sort of call and response thing, and I found that, you know, through trial and error, that if you say the Russian for hedgehog with a microphone, yosh, it sounds great, yosh. So I got, you know, doing the call and response, that's good. And then I just suddenly thought, I bet nobody has ever got an audience to do call and response to asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. And, oh, I had, anyway, that was, I enjoyed myself. Um, not sure about the audience. And then, but every time the band came on to tune their theremin or whatever it was, they all why? The audience was so happy to see them, and I was just kind of left feeling a little inadequate. And so I did ask them, I said, I'm going to get my camera out, I'm going to take a photograph of you all pretending to be pleased to see me. So could you please do that? And the entire crowd went absolutely wild. I took a photograph, I got home. <laughs> Does anybody know who she is? Ruined <laughs> oh, really my moment. I mean, to have a bit of Photoshop, I could probably get round it, but um... anyway. So, getting back to the asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship and the relationship between badgers and hedgehogs. Sorry, this, I, this towards the I thought coming to the end of a conference, I should probably leaven the thing a little bit. But there is some proper science behind this. It's not just sort of made up stuff by a hedgehog lover. And experiments have been done. Um, some of, one of which I dismissed right as, when I first read it, as a badger feeding experiment. Hedgehogs were released into White and Woods, the densest population of um, badgers, I think, in the world, isn't it? Um, and uh, because there's been, no, there's been no hedgehogs in White and Woods for, since research has been up there. Um, and the story amongst the sort of zoologists was it was the gypsies ate them all, but no, it wasn't the gypsies. Yeah. Um, and so they did a badger feeding experiment in which the badgers ate the hedgehogs. Um, and the way they phrased it was, the populations returned to their previous levels fairly quickly. <laughs> which was a level when there were no hedgehogs. I mean, a lot of them also just moved away. But this, is, this isn't the only problem um, which, which hedgehogs face. Um, and this is why I think it's important to put this thing into the wider context. The only way you're going to f grow a field of oilseed rape 
is if, um, don't make lots of money for it obviously, is if you get rid of one of those important things, which is the edges, the hedges. Hedgehogs aren't called hedgehogs on a whim. They hog the hedges, they're edge specialists, woodland edge specialists. This sort of environment will fragment the landscape completely. It'll stop a hedgehog moving across it because there is no food in that area, because the whole place is being covered in agrochemicals, and because there are no edges for the hedgehog to move between. Well, I forgot to say, the additional problem that badgers present is that they fragment the landscape as well. They chop the landscape up into smaller pieces for hedgehogs. So when you have a, uh, a village, um, a rural village, and you have uh, hedgehogs in that village, they will tend to leave the village along the linear features um, or, or radial distribution along the hedgerows. And if they come across radio tracking studies have shown, if they come across evidence of badgers, a badger set, a badger latrine, they will stop and they will come back again. And this then means it's much harder for the hedgehogs to move through the wider environment. And this is a serious issue. Anyway, this area here, it's devoid of food and it's got no edges for the hedgehogs to walk along. Um, an indication just of the problem that this industrialised agriculture presents to wildlife um, can be looked at from birds. All species of birds declined by over 10% in the last 40 or so years, but farmland birds have declined by over 50% in that time. The birds need the insects too, the insects which the hedgehogs are relying upon. We have created an environment out there which is very, very low in food. When you move from rough pasture to intensive crops, you can reduce the macro invertebrate concentration of the uh, field margins by up to 90%. So that's 90% less food for both badgers and hedgehogs to be sharing. And when they have that disruption in the environment, the relationship shifts from competition to one of predation. Okay, so the most stereotypical problem that hedgehogs face, um, roads, we all know that, I mean, this is, we use mammals on roads for the very good reason that hedgehogs are obvious, but there is an issue here. Not only are probably well over 100,000 hedgehogs killed on the roads each year, but roads, again, fragment the landscape into smaller and smaller pieces. We now have roads with concrete barriers along them as well, so that they are utterly impassable to most wildlife smaller than a muntjac, <coughs> roe deer, even. Um, so this means we've got the landscape chopped up into smaller pieces, uh, as well as the loss of land through agriculture, as well as the presence of badgers. Um, obviously, we're now looking at genetically engineering slightly larger hedgehogs, um, because actually that's probably going to be an easier job than dealing with our infrastructure. And actually, when a lot of these things you come down to it, I was interviewed um, a couple of years ago by BBC South. We'd done an inter TV interview about the whole... Um, issue about what we could do in the gardens, make a garden hedgehog friendly, make a hole in the fence, make sure that you've got a compost, even a log pile, and you've rolled a netting up around your fruit bushes, and you've got a gorgeous hedgehog friendly garden. And the interviewer stopped, and she just said, well, but if we were to be really serious, because she recognised, as we all do, this is tinkering, it's tinkering. If we're to be serious about getting hedgehog populations back up to where they once were, then what do we need to do? Now, I've done a lot of media work in the time, and I know that you should never answer an unusual question without thinking, but I did. And I said, well, we need to dismantle industrial capitalism. <laughs> and you could just see the blood drain from her face. <laughs> and because the point is, this is, if I could go onto the radio and swear my head off and there'd be an apology and it would all be okay eventually. But if you do that, you say those words, that's not allowed. Anyway, she remembered it was a pre-record and it all got edited out. But, it's, you know, we can't manage to deal with um, you know, the infrastructure. It's very hard to tackle the issues of industrial agriculture. So you know, we've set up, um, and, and, to, sorry, and to deal with the issues of fragmentation on a large scale. So we obviously need to look and do what we can here. And the reason I'm going on about this is because it paints the picture of why the hedgehog suffers so much and why the badger is a part of it. The problem is this issue of fragmentation. This is one hedgehog in one 30 or so hectare golf course in Surrey over 12 nights. Hedgehogs need a very large area to thrive. Um, the males were averaging 32 hectares for a home range, the females around 10 hectares. And this is significant because um, when you start to do what's known as a minimum viable population analysis, you look at what hedgehogs need to survive. You find they need, they need a starting population of over 30. And they need a home, they need an area of 90 hectares, at least, of the best quality habitat. 90 hectares of unfragmented really good quality land. In the countryside, that needs to be up to four or five square kilometers of really good quality well, of rural land. It's not very good quality for hedgehogs, but it's better than nothing. And this is where the problem lies. You fragment the landscape up, you create populations which are too small to be able to thrive. And I believe this is where the heart of the problem is. 
And this is where I live in Oxford. I'll like pop by for a cup of tea. Florence Park, gorgeous area. I've lived in the area for nearly 20 years. The last four years I've not seen any hedgehogs. Now this is, I believe, because we have a ditch running along here, which is canalised. We have a very busy road there, another busy road over here, another busy road here. This whole area is about 30 hectares. It's too small to support a viable population of hedgehogs. And so what you've got is not what happened four years ago, which is what my friends and neighbours have been asking, it's what happened 30 or 40 years ago. Things that happened a long time ago are impacting now on the mobility of hedgehogs to be able to thrive. And on this, the ditch, I've rescued three hedgehogs so far from this ditch. I don't walk past it that often, especially in daylight, and that's when you're going to see them. Um, yeah, there's nothing that's going to get out of the ditch. Come on, come on. Anyway, this is why we set up in the end Hedgehog Street. And at Hedgehog Street, we've actually put up a position statement about badgers. We are clearly aware that there is an impact on the hedgehog's ability to thrive from the presence of badgers. However, we do not support in any way a cull, however it is painted. And there are some people out there who are very, very keen to see the hedgehog used as a weapon to beat the badger. Um, I'm sure that Oliver Colville, the Tory MP for um, Plymouth, does really love hedgehogs. However, I'm deeply suspicious um, because it has become his absolute I think he does. He talks, talks about hedgehogs. The first debate in Parliament since 1566 um, was, was, uh, took place uh, this year. Was it the end, end of last year? And um, fantastic. I got my first mention in Parliament, my first mention in Hansard. Um, I was described as eccentrics like Hugh Warwick. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a part of me which is concerned about the sudden interest amongst some of the people who live in the Southwest and happen to be Tory MPs in the face of the hedgehog. Because if suddenly everybody is loving hedgehogs, maybe, maybe there is an opportunity there to gain some leverage in attacking badgers. And again, I don't want that to happen, and the Hedgehog Street Project does not want that to happen. And we're very keen that the hedgehog is not used to attack those evil hedgehog eating, no, sorry, those wonderful black and white furry animals. Um, I'm frequently sent images and stories based around this because people want to prove to me. Well, actually, there's two sets of stories that happen regularly. Uh, there is this one, which is, um, here we have a hedgehog chasing away three young badgers. Um, uh, what I'm fairly sure, again, sorry, Daily Mail. The rodent continues to stare the remaining badger down. <laughs> rodent. But these are young badgers. I'm sure that in about six months' time, they came back and ripped the poor hedgehog to pieces. <laughs> but no. This is frequently sent to me as proof that, that there isn't a problem. And, and this is where, and it is not a defence that you can use when you're confronted by people attacking you because of the situation with hedgehogs. This is exactly the same as I get regularly with, well, here's a picture of a hedgehog and a slug eating from the food bowl. How dare you say hedgehogs eat slugs? Well, yeah, when you've got a choice between a slug and a bowl of, of, of mealworms. You know, I'm, I think even I would probably choose the mealworms. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure whether 30 years of vegetarianism are going to go on mealworms. But anyway, you get the idea. You know, it's, not a, um, it's not a sort of fair argument. The reason these images come about is because what I said at the beginning is the relationship they have. This is a honeypot. This is an area where the stress is removed, where there is plenty of food, so they can operate side by side. When they are in a more stressed environment, then is where the issues align, uh, will, will arise. Uh, but yeah, this I present to you as sort of evidence of what is going on. What we do with it is another matter. Now what I would really like to see is far more work done making the countryside something in which wildlife of all forms can thrive. And shifting the emphasis from attacking one portion of wildlife to defend another. I mean, yeah, the US hedgehogs are another case in point. <clears throat> Um, so, yes, hedgehogs were causing part of the problem with the breeding bird success up there. I accept that. I went up there, I witnessed it, I helped stop the cull. But it is, to go up there and say, you know, this is not the problem, is not the way forward. You need to accept that there is some relationship between these two creatures. But to then become more positive and proactive in the way you confront it, which is to look at the wider environment, look at the things which are affecting hedgehogs, and look at ways we can hopefully increase the chances of them to thrive. And that's what the research we're currently analysing may begin to throw up. Find parts of the country where both badgers and hedgehogs are and find out what it is about those areas which is special. Because in the end, I know you like badgers, but actually, 
Hedgehogs are far cuter. <laughs> Emily, get out the door, get out the door. Okay. Okay. I can just contentious here, right? Two minutes, I'll just be contentious. None of the other has been. The hedgehog is easily the most important creature on the planet. I mean, look at the big issue. Marginalising Obama and, yeah, and Desmond Tutu. <laughs> And the reason I put this up here, and actually the point is this does apply to some extent to badgers, but not as much, is that we need to do more than just look after badgers. We need to do more than just look after hedgehogs. We need to look after the wider natural world. We need to create that. We need to manage it in a way that we are not disturbing things too much. We're always going to have some impact. That's always going to be the case. We're in the Anthropocene now. We have to accept it. But we need to find a way of doing this which is a little bit more sophisticated. But we're not going to do that if we don't care. And a lot of the problem we've got now is that we are encouraged to like stuff on social media. We're encouraged in a half-hearted way to observe nature through television. You know, I'm looking forward to the Dave Dashborough thing tonight. I really am. But there is a risk that we feel we've done nature because we watched Spring Watch. We pressed the red button and watched a bit more Spring Watch. It is a real need to move beyond a half-hearted relationship and moving into a full-hearted one. And it's an American writer, Stephen Jay Gould, who captured this perfectly. He said, we will not fight to save what we do not love. And I think he's absolutely correct. We need to fight to make the differences that need to happen. But it's very difficult to get people to fall in love with nature. Nature's a very nebulous thing. It's a very vague thing. So we need a gateway species. We need something which can attract people in. And the hedgehog, well, this the cutest. <laughs> Lots of wildlife charities. They know that we, this is the concept they need to follow. And so they use the charismatic megaphone, the elephants and tigers, whales and dolphins, to try and sell us a love of nature. So it just juice us into falling in love with the natural world. But that's a bit like relying on um, A-list celebrities in Heat Magazine or the guilty strip down the right-hand side of the Daily Mail website, I've heard. And um, this is... I mean, I always like to get nose-to-nose -nose with Angelina Jolie as I am with the humpback whale. You know, these things aren't going to happen. But in the end, if we're trying to... Yeah, if we're lucky, we'll end up falling in love with the girl or the boy next door. It's a great start, you know? And if we're lucky, we'll get nose to nose with some wildlife. You know, the hedgehog is the animal equivalent of the girl or the boy next door. It's the one you've got a chance to get close to. It doesn't have a fight or flight response. It stays there. You can get to look at it. You can look into its beady little eyes. When you do that, when you get a chance to look at a hedgehog, just remember, this animal, the one on the left, is... <laughs> it's bigger... So 99% of all animals that have ever lived on this planet. It's bigger than, you know, the ni other, it's in the same 1% as, as the blue whale and the Tyrannosaurus rex and us. It is a magnificent, fantastic predator. And we can get close to it without fear of losing fingers, noses, other things like that. And this is why it's so crucial, because once you've got close to nature, when you've really got close to it, not just throwing bread at ducks in the park, or peanuts at badgers. Um, <laughs> when you got really close to wildlife, you form an extra connection. And that's the one which can shift us from liking stuff to actually loving it. And when we love stuff, we will fight for it. And we need to get people falling in love. So that's why the hedgehog is so important. And thank you so much for this slightly insectivorous in, um, in, in interruption to your otherwise very badger-oriented day. Thank you.